From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 166, recorded on February 12th, 2019. Joining me today from a remote location, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Also joining us from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hey, Daniel. We're all three of us in remote locations. We today. are. All right. Let's jump right into this because we have a lot of guesses. What's the case from last time, Daniel? All right. For those of you clicking back in and those of you tuning back in, um, so those of you, I, I, I'm discombobulated too. And I, and for me, it's a, so for everyone tuning in for the first time and those of you tuning back in, let me acquaint you with the case from uh, last week, which apparently is quite popular. We had a uh, deluge of emails, which we will somehow have to try to work our ways through. But as I told everyone, we were still in Eastern Uganda. We were in the shadow of Mount Elgon. We're actually on the Western side. There's a famous Kittim cave on the East side, which uh, people might be aware of from um, the Marburg virus outbreak. Um, There's been some cases out of there. We actually were on Marburg alert. We actually had a whole protocol in place. But um, we're on the western side um, of Mount Elgon in eastern uh, Uganda. And we are seeing a young boy. Now, this young boy had come from the north of us, come quite a way uh, to see me. And it was a teenager, and he was there with a concern that he had a large swelling in his scrotum. It was on the left side. We said it was about four to six centimeters in diameter. Um, And it was actually on exam. It was superior to the testicle, so above the testicle. Um, We asked a little bit more history, and the young man said that he was not the only one from his area who had um, this issue. There were other young men who had similar problems. Um, I also kind of fishing around a little, I said, well, what about other things that I think might be related, such as large swollen legs? And he said, yes, you know, for example, my brother's wife, her left leg is large, swollen, sort of an irregularity to it. Um, When we examined the young boy, this uh, swelling in the the scrotum, it's non-tender, but I did comment that it transilluminates. So when you shine a light, it actually glows. That was the most interesting part for me. <laughs> the, glowing, <laughs> the glowing. Is that the tip-off for you, Vincent? Well, it wasn't a tip-off, but I'm hoping to learn about why. You know, ah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this case a little bit before uh, before our recording started. And um, I don't think we have a picture of, well, later on when we find out what this is, but I don't think we have a picture of this particular manifestation in our book. And, and it's interesting. You know, I, I mean, this was not the only one that I saw while I was in Uganda. I think I mentioned that the... Um, the, the one of the sons of the richest man in um, Uganda or in actually in our Baduda region uh, that one of his sons had a, had the same issue. Um, but it is one of those things where um, I would feel a little uncomfortable. And I, I think sometimes patients would feel a little uncomfortable with with a photograph of this. But I've um, seen some pretty dramatic um, photographs where obviously neither participant was um, as uncomfortable with photographing it as I would be in a lot of these situations. Sure. Mm, yeah. All right. Our first guest is from Lise, who writes, I think this young man has filarial parasite that is causing the swollen scrotum. These are nematodes that cause filariasis in humans. There's three species. The most characteristic, Wucheraria bancrofti infects only humans, Brugia manali, which can infect feline and monkeys, and gives some highlights of the life cycle. Um, Characteristic inflammation due to the dead or dying adult worms that trigger inflammatory reactions. Lymphedema is caused by occluded lymph channels by calcified worms. Also interesting to notice the male scrotum is frequently affected and may become as gigantic as 10 kilograms for treatment. 
It's recommended to look for co-infection with Loa Loa due to the risk of severe adverse events. I base all my facts on the fantastic Parasitic Diseases 6th edition book, which I'm trying to get a signed copy of this time. I also want to use this time to congratulate you all for the great podcast that you make every week or so for us. Thank you for your time and devotion to parasites. Lastly, I wanted to say that I found your podcast thanks to one of my eukaryotic microbes professor from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, who probably will never know how hard I fell in love with Paris with parasites after his class. Thank you to all science professors out there whose dedication to their job has great impact on our lives and never take credit for it. Saludos from Ann Arbor, Michigan, currently exper- experiencing a really bad winter storm this week. Very good. Dixon. Yes. Uh, to Sophia writes, Dear professors, greetings from Greece. My diagnosis for this case is lymphatic filariasis caused by W. Bancrofty. This conclusion was made after searching in your book and reading that, quotes, lymphatic filariasis should be suspected in an individual who resides in an endemic region, <clears throat> is beyond the first decade of life, and has lymphedema in the extremities or genitalia, un- uh, end quotes. Now, I am hoping this young man did receive the medication and doses needed to get rid of this infection. However, I do have a question. So, how does this NGO work towards preventing of prevention of disease? I think it would be more efficient if the patients, besides their medication, were given insecticides, bed nets, etc., anything needed to make sure they don't get reinfected. Along those lines, you mentioned in your book that there is a goal to, to eliminate lymphatic filariasis by the year 2020. That's on page 267, by the way. Uh, okay, so it's 2019 now. We have one year left. How does this NGO or the Ministry of Health in Uganda work towards this goal? Does the NGO collect and send up any logical data to the ministry, for example? Does someone else do that? I can't see any progress in elimination. Otherwise, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, on and under my email for EP163 got lost in the queue. And I have a question about that case as well. My question was, how did the man with suspected leishmaniasis decide to come to see you and didn't proceed with the surgical intervention? Was he afraid of surgery? What would happen if he did go to the surgery instead? My point here being that timing and choosing the right doctor can make all the difference in one's prognosis. Anyway, I don't want to write too much and take up radio space time. Uh, Thank you for doing this. All the best. Uh, Yeah, all the best. Let me, can we, let's, let's discuss a few of these things here that are, that are brought up. Um, so, um, I guess the first thing is, um, yeah, we're getting pretty close to 2020 <laughs> and, um, and yeah, it's uh, <laughs> coming down to the wire and, um, uh, sometimes, you know, I don't want to say that I'm, I'm saying this is, uh, Wucheraria Bancroft yet, um, but who knows, maybe we'll get there. Um, but. I, when I, when I do a talk about Wuchereria Bancrofti and I talk about it in Uganda, it, it's really impressive to watch over the last 10 years, um, the dramatic, um, success in reduction of lymphatic filariasis cases. Um, and the, the particular region where I was working in Baduda, actually, it used to, if you go 10, 15 years back, it used to be a common diagnosis in that area. So there, there is, um, there is actually a fair amount of progress being made, and it reminded me, um, Dixon. We we went to the Explorers Club, right? To that. Uh, yeah, we uh, did. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Uh, if anyone gets a chance, go to the Explorers Club in New York City. It's it used to be uh, Teddy Roosevelt's club, <laughs> and uh, they. It was uh, what, what was that NDI? So Neglected Disease Initiative. Yes, um, is yes. that who was sponsoring it? And I think the Huffington Post was involved, yeah, that's but it right. was a, a, a virtual reality experience of these different. It was diseases. quite amazing, actually. And um, one of one of the people, one of the explorers, sort of asked, like, so we're talking all about drugs. What about the non um, uh, pharmaceutical approaches? And um, one of the nice things about bed nets, etc., is that. Um, a lot of adults can, in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa that I've talked to, have have sort of dismissed malaria as, oh, it's what you worry about when you're a kid. And But I must tell you that a lot of adults in parts of Africa, the idea that you might get lymphatic filariasis and end up with a 20-kilogram scrotum um, is a bit of a motivator for the use of bed nets. That's right. 
Um, so it's interesting. There's a dynamic here. I think we talked about this with the step wells. What, what makes the people want to drink clean water? What makes people want to use bed nets versus what um, an NGO might think should be the motivation behind the initiative? So uh, progress, but boy, I'm not sure 2020 is going to be, uh, if we're going to make it by then, but there is a lot of progress in, in, in reduction in the number of cases. One of the biggest problems I think I should add is the fact that more than one kind of mosquito can transmit Phyloriasis. So it's not like malaria, where only the uh, uh, plasmodium uh, organisms can be transmitted by anopheline mosquitoes. In this case, both anopheles and culicine mosquitoes can transmit this infection. So they have so many different biologies, each species of each of those groups, that it's very difficult to do a mosquito control program. So I think a lot of this is community drugs with uh, diethylchlorbamazine and lots of others applied at the same time. But that requires constant pressure and, and political stability. And I think for some areas, maybe not Uganda, but for some other areas, perhaps that's the reason why progress has been rather slow in the eyes of the general public. In the eyes of people living in the area, though, I'm sure they've noticed differences. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, and I think that's one of the pearls for people to remember when they're trying to uh, remember what's unique about lymphatic filariasis. We say malaria, female anopheles, mosquitoes, only the 1% double biters. We think about um, sleeping sickness, tsetse fly. Um, we think about river blindness um, and the black fly. Um, but the, one of the tough things here is because there are many vectors is the most successful programs have involved um, pharmaceuticals. And uh, I remember, I don't know if we talked about it on one of the prior trips, but I had a patient from uh, Guyana down in South America, and he was very upset about lymphatic filariasis, blaming it on corrupt politicians, because when he had been younger, there was a point when they were doing a great job with um, the the drug campaigns. And then the money was not there. It was going somewhere else. And he saw an increase in the number of people with Bigfoot, as they call it down there. And it's the elephantiasis. So yeah. It's... Daniel, what about the leishmaniasis question? You want to tackle that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, there's a lot in here. So it, it was interesting. Yeah. I, I think the point is well taken. Um, the timing of coming to the right doctor makes a big difference. And unfortunately, this gentleman went for two years bouncing from doctor to doctor, was just sort of ready for surgery, when I think he finally scratched his head and said, you know what, I I've seen people down in Costa Rica with problems like this. And somehow in his head was a concern for mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, if you can imagine. And his father then did a bit of a search, found me, uh, connected us. Um, and as I think I pointed out in follow up, this poor young man, he is now um, he had a cancer develop in the edge of the leishmaniasis. He's preparing for a major surgery. He's going to need chemotherapy, radiation. We're going to have to treat him again because I anticipate a flare with this. Um, so we're going through all this and um, really, really tough when if this had been caught early, treated at an early stage, it would have been a much more minor thing. Oh, sorry. So it's really, really tough. Daniel, can you take the next one? Uh, Yosef, it's been a while, but Yosef writes, Dear TWIP team, I believe the patient has an infection involving Wucheraria bancrofti that is leading to lymphedema of his scrotum. Although this seems localized to the epididymis from your description, I don't know if the infection can be limited to the lymph nodes draining that area, although I don't see why not. Well, I was in... Kisoro, we did have a few cases of elephantiasis, but there were always patients who had traveled from northern Uganda and none were local. Uh, sincerely, Yosef Davidoff, and he says, P.S. I am currently in the combined emergency medicine internal medicine program at North Shore LAJ. Well, look at that. He's right around the block from you. Yeah, that's where I was this morning. Started at LAJ and then North Shore. And <laughs> so I am sure we will cross paths. But um, it, it's interesting. And actually, um, it's hard to do this, I think, on a podcast because I always like to show vis visuals when I explain this. But there's a there's a, a something called a tunica vaginalis, which sits right above the testicle, um, and it's not really the epididymis that is swelling, um, but this potential space becomes um, full when someone has um, this issue, um, a hydrocele, 
from um, lymphatic filariasis. And this fluid-filled um, collection is what can get up to 20 kilograms, what can get the size of um, a, we'll say a football, but a proper football, not an American football. Not fluid-filled, to be honest. It's filled with smooth muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. I've seen, we had a scrotum that we used to bring out on display for the medical students. It wasn't even a full scrotum. It was like a quarter of the scrotum. It was the size of a very good size piece of watermelon. Mm -hmm. And the tissue inside was, um, it displaced all of the space inside this uh, piece of tissue that was cut off of this gentleman when they performed the uh, surgery. And I got a look at the slides that were made from that and virtually all of the tissue that you could see was smooth muscle tissue, which looked as though it, they were derived from the the uh, ad adjacent tissues next to the circulatory system. So it's not a, it's not fluid filled to be honest. I don't, I've, I've never heard that before. Let's put it that way. No, actually, I think that's a I think that's a good point, and I and I believe it's an issue of the chronicity. But yes, so initially you start off with the fluid, but over time it ceases to truly transilluminate. No, and this is maybe maybe uh, Vincent will enjoy this. Um, so early on, you're filling with fluid, but over time, so we sort of talk about early stage versus late stage. Over time, it actually becomes um, this this thickened tissue. And it is not just fluid anymore. And at that point, it's a it's a much more extensive surgery because you're going to have to remove this whole thing. And yeah, so no, it's actually that's a good point. An interesting way to look at it is that the fluid that starts to accumulate from the lymphatic blockage serves as a growth medium, and the tissue that expands as a result of that feeds off of the nutrients that are located in the lymph. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's a whole. It's interesting. There's a whole immune response that's going on, and um, you know, at some point, maybe we could do like the immunology of lymphatic filariasis. But uh, yeah, it involves T cells and has an issue again with Th1 versus Th2, and and why you get the the different responses because if you think about these areas where everybody is exposed to all these different vectors, but fortunately, um, not everyone is developing uh, these manifestations. All right, our next guest is from Leah, dear Twipsters. Hello, longtime listener. I finally managed to submit my guess in time. I hope, I strongly suspect that the patient described as suffering from lymphatic filariasis. This came to mind as soon as the presence of individuals with swollen legs in the area was mentioned. And to confirm my suspicion, I consulted PD. All right. And uh, Leah suggests treating with. As long as he is not co-infected with Loa Loa, should be treated with diethylcarbamazine, though all individuals in the area would ideally be screened and treated, including the asymptomatic ones. Leah writes, I'm in my fourth year of a PhD in immunology at the University of Calgary. My project focuses on immunoparasitology, specifically the mechanisms of protective immunity involved in naturally acquired immunity to Leishmania major. Admittedly, my project focuses more on the immunology than the parasitology side of things, so I love listening to your podcast to keep my parasitology skills fresh. While I enjoy academia, I'm also very interested in science communication, and I always appreciate and admire the clarity with which you explain complicated concepts. Definitely something I try to emulate in my outreach activities. Thank you very much for your time. While I find the digital copy of PD extremely useful, I would love to be entered into the draw for the physical textbook. Leah. All right, Dixon, you are next. Ivan writes, Dear Twip Illuminators, first about the case. According to everything stated, a young teenager from Uganda is suffering from lymphatic filariasis. Everything fits nicely, even the WHO report on ongoing filariasis in Uganda. I especially like the way Daniel described that this lesion glowed. This clearly indicates, together with the fact that this is non-tender swelling, that the contents of it is edema fluid accumulating due to obstructed lymphatic drainage. A balloon full of plain water would make the exact same effect. 
Regarding the etiology, I think we could not be 100% without additional tests, but it's one of the following in decreasing order of probability. The unpronounceable Wuchereria brancrofti, Brugia malayi, or Brugia timori. <clears throat> I remember in one of the early uh, episodes, Vincent and Dick discussed this topic. I think Dick then mentioned that Brugia malayi in primates is the only animal model for this disease. However, during my studies at ACPV, ECVP, excuse me, European College of Veterinary Pathology, for the board exam, I found that the notorious Wuchereria bancrofti can actually be studied in the silvered leaf monkey. Not probably a very significant fact, but still. Here are the references, and he gives a reference for all those things. And then he uh, goes on to say, therapy for this young Ugandan, sure, but I'll just leave the therapy part to Kevin and all the other correspondents, and of course, our doc in charge. <clears throat> and now, for a few words regarding the Daniel's kind uh, proposition to ask parasites without borders for parasitic diseases, sixth edition. I will try a bit more to win it by a bit of luck on the show. And I don't mind waiting as long as it is signed. In case I really get tired of writing guesses, then I'll shoot an email to PWB. Either way, I promise never to use it, as Daniel used Robin's pathology on his road trip. <laughs> Fortune favors the brave, or at least the persistent. Keep up the great show. P.S. I know this is the wrong podcast, but big, no, no, not big, an enormous applause for the selection of topics for TWIV 532. And what were those topics, Dixon? The topics were ASF and Peste de Petis Ruminants. Peste de Petit Ruminant. Uh, indeed. I couldn't have said it worse myself. <laughs> Ivan is from Zagreb, Croatia, EU. Yes, indeed. Daniel. I think Ivan was making mention that we have yet to send a hard copy to Croatia. So uh, uh, we're, we're rooting for you, Ivan. Uh, Benning writes, greetings, twit professors. It is a freezing 24F here in Atlanta. My guess is lymphatic filariasis caused by Wucheria ban Crofty. He also mentions several other, um, as we've had. And he does say, he says, this case seems fairly straightforward, but I would love if Daniel could shed some light. I think that was a pun on the translumination. Um, and then he asked, we able to visualize worms using this method? All right, that's Benning. Oh, this guy's a one-time winner. Look at that. Now, Benning, you won back in November, and it hasn't been sent yet because I'm out of autographed books. And we were going to autograph some today, but the, the snowstorm prevented Daniel from coming in. So be patient. We'll get to it. Yes, we will. All right. Shelby writes, uh, I would like to submit my guess. Wucheraria bancrofti, filariasis, filariasis, of course, uh, to test this, perform a peripheral blood smear looking for juvenile worms or an x-ray to look for calcified remains uh, and treatment, Dr. Google. Thank you all the podcasts. They make the drive between Nashville and MTSU far more entertaining. All right. Who's next? Dixon? Adam writes, Hi, <clears throat> my guess for the case in TWIP 165 is lymphatic filariasis caused by Wuchereria bancrofti. Best regards, Adam from Halmstad, Sweden. Karen writes, Dear TWIP Trio, I love your podcast. I recently listened to episodes approximately 55 through 65 during a round-trip drive to the University of California, Davis, for a conference on the Pacific Southwest Center for Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. Researchers who study mosquitoes, ticks, and vector-borne diseases shared their findings with public health personnel and each other. The center is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and also awards several grants for one-year studies. It sounds like the patient in episode 165 is suffering from lymphatic filariasis, which is called hydrocele when present in the scrotum. A filarial worm that is vectored from person to person by mosquito bites causes lymphatic fluid to accumulate in the scrotum, which we have Bancrofti. As Vincent mastered that pronunciation, an emoji with a little wink, uh, is the species of filarial worm in Africa vectored by nocturnal mosquitoes with no reservoir hosts. Surgery, such as described by this 210 paper, um, 2010 paper, excuse me, uh, as a reference to a, a, a NIH paper, would be an effective treatment. Yearly doses of ivermectin or albendazole could be given to the population in the endemic area to interrupt transmission with the goal of eliminating the worm from the region. Thanks for all the brain candy, 
Karen, she's a vector born control, vector control technician in Santa Barbara, California. Hey, Karen, Wucheraria Bancrofty. <laughs> you said it like a pro. <laughs> I have good teachers. Ah. All right. Sarah writes, dearest podfessors, I write to you with a case guess and my sincerest apologies to Dr. Griffin. I was horrified to hear in the last episode, Twit 165, that Dr. Griffin had tried to contact the Glasgow Science Girls on his recent visit to Glasgow and Scotland and heard nothing back. We would obviously have left a special guest at one of our meetings. I can't tell you how sad I am to have missed it. I no longer have access to the email as I've been in self-imposed exile in New Zealand and Australia for the past few months. Don't feel bad for me. It's pretty great down here, but I'm still active on the blog and Twitter. I hope Dr. Griffin enjoyed his trip anyway, and indeed, it sounds like he did. I always love hearing a bit about my old stomping grounds. I used to work at the Center for Virus Research that Dr. Yellow mentions visiting, and I studied parasitology for five years at the University of Glasgow. Despite the terrible weather, I don't know how many types of rain you all have encountered on your Scotland travels, but I'm convinced there are more than four. I loved living in Glasgow and Scotland. I even like haggis. Hopefully, I'll be back sometime and overlap the return visit. I'm sure you'd be welcome back, Dr. Griffin. And I actually, I will be back there next January. So we'll see how that goes. Um, now for my guess, lymphatic filariasis. Um, and let's see, the most likely culprit is Wucheraria Bancrofti. Um, and let's see, I'm not familiar with the techniques available for diagnosis um, in Uganda, but methods include microscopic identification of larvae in the blood, preferably drawn at night, ELISA's PCR and ultrasound. And as for treatment, it's first, according to PD6, um, important to establish the patient does not suffer from a co-infection with Loa Loa. And yep, there we go. And then she talks a little bit about mass administration um, and bed nets for the night biters. And she's crossing her fingers for a book and forever looking forward to the next episode. Cheers, Sarah, the exiled science girl. <laughs> it's funny little postscript. She says she's filled out the other surveys, TWIV and TWIM. Uh, now I mainly listen when doing yoga, and I'm only too eager to interrupt my exercise for such important things. Some some might say too eager, given the amount of cinnamon buns we Swedes eat. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. All right, Sue Ellen writes, when I heard the case study from this past week's episode, I immediately thought of elephantiasis. So I went to PD6 and started there. I hope I got it right. I already have a book, so pass it on. Thanks so much. Can't believe how much I know now about parasites. Sue Ellen is in Roswell, Georgia. Dixon. It's ironic that she should write in for this particular case, because if you say her name very fast, it sort of matches the symptomatology of the patient we were talking about. You got it, Dixon. Swellen. That's it. Ken writes, <laughs> greetings to the purveyors of parasitic knowledge. Thank you so much for this podcast and Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition. PDF version would love a hard copy. Vincent and Dixon may remember me from TWIV 195. They did it in the hot tub. I have been listening to TWIP for a while, but this is my first case guess. This seems to be a case of lymphatic filariasis, given the numerous hints given by Dr. Griffin and the subsequent checks online, and the definitive source, PD6, probably caused by an infection with Wuchria Bancrofti. Fortunately, I'm not a physician and never have claimed to be one, so I will leave the treatment to experts. In case you're wondering why I'm a crossover from TWIV, my lab has recently started to work on improving diagnosis for soil-transmitted helminths. Long story that I will spare you. And TWIP has helped immensely with my extremely steep learning curve. Thank you so much. When we get something published, I will send it your way. And if you're interested enough, maybe we can have a TWIP follow-up to a TWIV. Thanks again. That's Ken Stedman, virology professor over in Portland. Nice. Daniel. Carol writes, greeting esteemed hosts. I've been too slow to send in an email for the past few months, but always enjoy listening to each episode. Sometimes it's with a mixture of delight and dismay because my guests would have been right for the case study, and sometimes with a mixture of relief and dismay because my guests would have been wrong. <laughs> Hopefully this week I will just experience delight. And she is also uh, 
putting forth a hydra seal, most likely due to Wuchereria ban crofty. Um, and then she gives us CDC recommended treatment and then says, I won't go into detail, differential lifestyle, et cetera. Um, whenever a Twix podcast lands in my feed, it moves straight to listen next. Nice. That's what we like to hear. We do. <laughs> Amikai writes, dear Twip trio, I've been listening for, to Twip for quite a while following my MSC advisor, Dr. Oren Kobilier of Tel Aviv University, recommendation with great joy. When I started my PhD six months ago, I moved from viruses to cellular pathogens, and I decided it was a good trigger to start listening to TWIP as well. I got hooked fast after binging the TWIP archive during my daily commute. Episode 165 was the first I've heard in close proximity to its release. This is particularly exciting for me because I have a guess, and the guess is, of course, Wuchereria Bancrofty. Thank you for your great and entertaining work. Ami Kai, C-H like in Loch, is from the Weizmann Institute of Science. Dixon, Dixon. Carrie writes, Dear Twipital Force, some people have swollen legs and some people have swollen genitals. This instantly put me, Carrie, in mind of a high school biology lesson. My teacher mentioned it. Well, he referred to it by the common term elephantiasis. I remember that he claimed that people trying to treat and control this condition in impoverished areas ran into difficulties because, so he said, people with swollen legs were happy to have their condition treated, but young men with greatly enlarged scrotums believed it to be not a disease at all, but a sign of virility and were reluctant to be cured of it. I was told a lot of things in high school. Some of them may even have been true. (laughs) But wild anecdotes aside, both of us are fairly sure of a diagnosis on this occasion. Lymphatic filariasis uh, occurs when the filarial worm blocks the ducts. The swelling is most commonly seen in the legs. Um, In this case, the fact that the swelling glows when a light is shone through it suggests there is no solid mass or structure to it, but rather it's hydrocele or accumulation of fluid. Which, of course, is by far the most common cause of filariasis worldwide, and the two Brugia species are both restricted to specific regions of Asia, so it's likely to be W. Bancrofty. However, we mustn't jump to conclusions. Could this be anything else? There aren't any other obvious parasitic causes for scroll swelling, even if we don't assume this patient's problem is connected with his sister-in-law's leg. A hydrocel can be caused by an injury or by STDs, but of course, this had to be one time Vincent didn't ask whether the patient is sexually active. Yet another possibility is inguinal hernia. And they go on to list several other <clears throat> prognoses, perhaps. So we are confident in our diagnosis, but still it would be advisable to confirm it. The evildoers, or at least our children, since it is the adult worms that cause the main symptoms, can be spotted wiggling around in the bloodstream at night. He should be treated with albendazole or ivermectin, and to prevent it, additionally, dosing with doxycycline should kill the symbiotic Wolbachia, sterilizing the adult worms and also causing early death. Well, you may have spotted them, but if not, we found a couple of interesting recent papers on this subject. And here's a trial with Artemisia as a possible treatment for schistosomiasis. The interesting thing is that the trial was of an infusion of the plant, not of ours and artemisinin, and that it appeared to outperform the current standard treatment. The second paper is about quinine's mode of action. Ah, it's about time, isn't it? Those two papers were brought to our attention by the excellent blog and the pipeline. If you don't read it, you should. That, that's our pick of the week. This letter is the product of your favorite transatlantic team, Carrie from Newcastle upon Time, England, and Caitlin living in the exile, living in exile in Seattle. <laughs> P.S. A cantrip is either a minor magical spell or a piece of devious trickery. Well, last time uh, when this team wrote, they said, Dear Can Twips. And I, and I said, I don't know what that means. So there you go. I would go for the devious trickery. What do you think? (laughs) Only when Daniel's cases confound everyone. Connor writes, hello, doctors. My gut leads me to think it's Bancroftian filariasis due to the classic hydrocele. Uh, The region, local specificity of persons with lymphadenopathy and elephantiasis. The younger age did seem a bit odd without continued high transmission levels and repeated biting leading to high microfilaremia. But in this case, the hoof beats lead me to think, which are area bancrofty, as that accounts for the vast majority of reported 
filariasis cases. Fingers are still crossed. Connor E. Dunn, Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Cool. Sneha writes, Dear TWIP team, I'm Sneha from Chennai, India. Recently completed my undergrad in biotechnology, hopefully waiting for positive responses from grad school applications. While I listen to TWIV and TWIM, this TWIP was my first episode, and now I'm wondering why I didn't follow it more regularly. All your podcasts give me something new to think about, and this one was no exception. As for the diagnosis, when I had heard swollen leg, I thought elephantiasis. And a little treatment talks about the global program to eliminate lymphatic filariasis, annual mass drug administration of anti-helminthic drugs to entire communities where the disease is endemic. Where does Uganda stand in this? Turns out the status of MDA's Uganda is ongoing. Program has been implemented regularly since 2010, and from 2013, there's been a decrease in the population of people requiring preventive chemotherapy every year. As of 2017, geographical coverage is 100%. 66% of the population requiring preventive chemo are getting treatment, and a little more than half the districts are getting effective coverage. And he puts a link to a graph. Yeah. All right. So teenager has lymphatic filariasis caused by Wuchereria bancrofti. I've never tried solving a case diagnosis before. I had quite some fun trying to figure this out. Hope the teenagers are fine now. All right, Dixon, you're next. Mike writes, dear professors, greetings from upstate New York, Rochester to be specific. Right now it's 33 degrees Fahrenheit with a weather advisory for freezing rain. Well, they were right on the money on that one. I believe the young man in the case study represents presents with a hydrocele of the left testicle brought about by lymphatic obstruction due to lymphatic filariasis, probably caused by Wuchereria bancrofti. This organism causes the syndrome known as elephantiasis, which the patient has said has occurred in several relatives. I've not been able to find out what size testicles elephants have, as the website's return from a Google search did not seem to me to be scientific. Hydrocele's transilluminates, meaning they glow when a light shines through the scrotum from behind. This is because they are filled with fluid, this case due to obstruction of the local lymphatic circulation, and so transmits some of the light. Asymptomatic hydrocele's do not require treatment, although surgery can be performed successfully. Treatment of the, filari of the filariasis is recommended, however, as it can potentially av avoid more extensive lymphatic damage. The usual treatment is with DEC, although prior treatment with ivermectin may be necessary as co-infection with onchocerciasis is a contraindication for use of DEC. I join with the other listeners in saying how much I hope you contribute your podcast indefinitely. How, <laughs> let's try that again. I join with the other listeners in saying how much I hope you continue your podcast indefinitely. And I consider you all heroes for sharing your knowledge and expertise with the world indefinitely is a pretty long time. Uh, but thank you for the thought. Regards, Dr. Mike Martin of Rochester, New York. Lovely. Okay. Folka. Folka writes, um, Dear Podfessors, easy case, I hope, lymphatic filariasis, also known as elephantiasis. Uh, now let's see. So I'm going to read the next one, too. Blair also writes, Dear Vincent Dixon and Daniel, hopefully I've managed to get my answer in time. And again, he's going with hydrocele secondary to Bancroftian filariasis. His brother's wife's also affected, he suggests. Uh, there are typical presentations, conditional seen in males and females, respectively. Uh, he does comment that um, he believes this is a disorder of lymphatic drainage. Uh, adults can live for a number of years, uh, produce millions of microfilaria. Mass, mass drug administration strategies in endemic areas have helped to dramatically reduce disease transmission. And um, despite the success of MDA, mass drug administration, uh, there's still a significant comorbidity burden associated with the established lymphatic damage. Um, this is not to be corrected by antifilarial treatment and may require surgical intervention. So I wanted to point that out. I think a lot of people have mentioned the drugs, but um, I think what he brings up is a good point. A lot of people who have the lymphatic um, damage 
or even, and this is a challenge, in areas where they try to introduce the medications, the dying worms, the inflammatory cascade can actually lead to people developing hydrocele's who didn't have them before. So, uh, I want to go back to uh, Folka. He writes at the end, Folka, LTL, FTW, longtime listener, first time writer, mathematician who got distracted from his childhood idea to become a scientist and ended up in finance. <laughs> it's never too late, Volker. <laughs> you could, if you came back now, we'd all love you. Then you can support infectious diseases. Red, uh, Blair, who, who Daniel just read, is a registrar in infectious diseases and general medicine in London. Daniel, what's a registrar? You know, I believe it's their form of like a, an intern or a resident. Am I, I correct see, about I that? See. Yeah, it's when they're like they've finished medical school, uh, but they have yet to become, we'll say, an attending. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next one's from Jessica. I'm a longtime listener as well as parasite and neglected tropical disease enthusiast. This is my first time making a case attempt, as I'm often an episode behind in my listening. This case particularly piqued my interest as I remember seeing similar presentations during my service as a Peace Corps volunteer in Madagascar. Wow. Where there happens to be a big measles outbreak at the moment. And plague. That's right. All right. So so uh, Jessica's guess, of course, is filarial infection by Wucheraria Bancrofti and uh, Talks about diagnosis and treatment. Many thanks for the podcast and all the great work that you do. You've provided me with hours of entertainment at the microscope as I comb for parasites in chimpanzee feces. And Jess is a DVM candidate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. Cool. Dixon. Benjamin writes, hi, Twipo Postrondulus. Long-time listener, first-time caller. I'm a PhD student at the University of Adelaide, Australia, where it is currently 28C, although we hit our all-time record temperature of 48C a B, over a week ago. I was introduced to TWIV recently, which was the first podcast that I ever listened to, before discovering the rest of the Twix series. A couple of months later, and I've listened to almost all of the TWIP episodes and can't imagine the prospect of doing my parasite culture without learning about the wild world of infectious diseases at the same time. <clears throat> Thank you for the wonderful podcasts and the reassurance that my utter fascination with parasites doesn't make me crazy. My case guess for this week is lymphatic filariasis caused by Wichereya Bancrofti, and he gives all the right reasons for saying that and mentions transillumination and the uh, fluid-filled lesion. Diagnosis can be confirmed by finding microfilaria in the blood, although you have to look at the right time in order for that to happen. There's a PCR test as well, and he mentions the drugs of choice are diethylcarbamazine and doxycycline. Um, and he doesn't think that low or low would be an issue in that region, uh, but uh, one never knows because of the climate change issues and the relocation of vectors. Keep up the wonderful entertainment. Regards, Ben. P.S. I think this would be a great paper for you to look at on TWIP. And then he gives a, a reference to a paper. There have been growing evidence for some time that there's a significantly underappreciated burden of Plasmodium vivax in West Africa, even in Duffy negative individuals. Presumably, this underappreciation is compounded by the fact that you're not looking, testing for P. vivax. You won't find it. <clears throat> this paper provides a mechanism for how P. vivax might be infecting these people. And he's a PhD right. candidate, so he's he's right on target here. This is great. All right. Maybe we'll do it. Yeah. Daniel. Yeah. At some, at some point, it'd be interesting to talk about the which subspecies of malaria are where and why we think what we think and confirmation bias issues. But Aaron Clare writes, I have been a listener for a couple months now, and I like to listen when I'm doing my repetitive lab tasks or waiting for the bus, which is consistently late. <laughs> I'm a biomedical sciences undergrad at the University of Manchester, UK, currently on a placement at Witten Herdecke University in Germany. And I recently got the opportunity to take a module on parasitology. I loved it more than anything in my education so far. And it has made me certain that this is something I want to pursue for a career. I consider myself a bit of a novice when it comes to parasites, but every episode I have kicked myself for not being brave enough to send a guess as they've all been diseases I've learned about so far. As soon as I heard of the patient's swollen scrotum, 
I had a pretty good idea of what the culprit is likely to be, but I thought I would do a control effing of the parasitic diseases textbook before I committed to my guess. Uh, the description of the swelling sounds very much like a hydrocele caused by the blockage of the inguinal lymph nodes, which is a common symptom of an infection with one of the filarial nematodes. The information of the swollen legs in the area gives us another symptom of the infection, elephantiasis. Um, and she goes on to talk about how the infection is transmitted uh, the blockage being caused by the accumulation of dead adult to worms and preventing the draining of lymph fluid. Um, and then she talks a little bit here about treatment and also does mention um, surgery. Best wishes to you all, Erin. And we got a PS. I would love to be entered to win a signed copy of her textbook. As a student, I don't have any new textbooks. They're all secondhand and covered in questionable drawings and messages. Oh, that's sad. That's sad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tatiana writes, dear TWIP Trio, undergrad zoologist at Swansea University here, South Wales, UK. I was there once years ago. I was there once in December. It was so cold. Two weeks ago, I was in Borneo where the, temp where the weather was consistently 35C and 100% humidity. Swansea is more like 3.5C. I took a parasitology module last year, discovered TWIP, while so filled with fever during this summer that I ended up sleeping on the kitchen floor to try and cool down. Speaking of Borneo, most of us who went there to do three weeks of field work in the rainforest and coral reefs had taken the parasitology module, but most people had consequently forgotten most of what we learned. They were not best pleased with my helpful facts about the various deadly parasites we could catch, which I remembered from my TWIP listening habit. I listen to a lot of other podcasts, but none of them are quite as informative as TWIP, and it has accompanied many long train journeys. Nice. When I saw TWIP 163, Trout and Parasites, I was very excited as my undergrad dissertation is on the behavioral changes in Salmotruta by the parasitic larvae, Glochidia of the freshwater pearl mussel. Interesting. Oh, wait. Let me let me tell you a few other things. Just talking about her work on... Uh, these uh, fish parasites, it's due here in 12 days. Uh, so her advisor is an amazing marine parasitologist who I admire greatly and whom I sincerely hope does not listen to TWIP. Uh, her, 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 her paper is due in, in 12 days, so I should probably be writing rather than this, but I consider this to be at least a productive form of procrastination. All right, so her guess, of course, is... Um, lymphatic filariasis. And uh, I hope the diagnosis is correct. The weather where you guys are is more pleasant. Oh, and that my story about my dissertation and the fact that I discovered TWIP while fevered and laying on a cold kitchen floor brought some amusement to you and other listeners. I look forward to hearing the next episode. <laughs> the dissertation. I didn't t tell her story about the dissertation. Let me go back to that. Uh, let's Let me read that. She's taking the data previously published by her supervisor and reanalyzing it using new statistical techniques to quantify how different factors such as time since infection, infection load, and sex affect the boldness of the fish. Many studies have indicated previously that the glochidia do not actually cause any significant physiological harm to the host in natural infection loads, and studies which do find that the parasite causes harm have used experimental loads far, far above what is found in nature. One study even indicated that the presence of glochidia could delay the senescence process of S. salar Atlantic salmon and prolong their lifespan five to six times. Though when I mentioned though when I mentioned this in my first draft, Dr. Thomas highlighted it and then commented underneath, Ziuganov says a lot of things. <laughs> Based on the casual sassy comment, including four ellipses and winky face with a nose, I assume that there is some large issue with Ziuganov's finding, which I have thus far failed to identify and write about. The comment did spook me. It was the nose on the winky face which did it. At another point in the same draft, Dr. Thomas highlighted a fact I had cited him as writing about in his paper, claimed that it was not true. It was very tempting to simply send him a screenshot of where he said it six years ago, perhaps perhaps accompanied by a photo of me raising my eyebrows questioningly. However, I refrained. He's an amazing marine parasitologist whom I admire greatly and whom I hope does not listen to TWIP. And now we understand why. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Tatiana. My goodness. 
Dixon. Till writes, Dear Daniel, Dick, and Vince. And, no, not Vincent, Vince. This week's case guess is once again an easy guess for the regular listener. The Filarial Parasite, which Wucherera Bancrofti, is the perpetrator in this case, causing the described hydrocele as well as the elephantiasis of the brother's wife. The vector for these parasites are several species of mosquitoes, and the disease can be found in South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as South and Southeast Asia. One question on this topic. Is the filarial dance sign, FDS, regularly used in establishing the diagnosis of lymphatic filariasis? Although I have never diagnosed a patient with LF myself, it seems that FDS is quite an easy is quite an easy thing to recognize a diagnostic sign if you know how to perform a sonography. However, I have read some papers that claim that the FDS is to be nonspecific, but also could be the result of clumps of protein or sperm cells sticking together. However, reading the article, I thought the two would have been quite easily distinguished. The clumps mentioned above are two to three millimeters at max and are immobile, while the elf adults are worms that are, for the females, three millimeters in diameter and can reach several centimeters in length, and that show a certain erratic pattern of movement. Could you help could you tell us your esteemed opinions about this? Thanks, and to all the best, Till. Um, mentions an ultrasound reference. Uh, the filarial dance is not characteristic of filariasis. Observe dancing megasperm on high-resolution sonography. Patients from non-endemic areas mimicking the filarial dance and a proposed mechanism for this phenomenon. Okay. I don't have an opinion about this one. <laughs> I won't dance. Don't ask me. <laughs> so yeah, so I'll jump in. It, it's interesting, you know, having having seen the filarial dance song. I get, and let, let me equate people. What you do here is, um, it, it, what they're pointing out. Actually, there there are some interesting issues. Um, if you go, I'm assuming the second one. I don't know if anyone opened the second one, but I'm assuming the second one is like the classic filarial uh, dance song. Did you guys Did you guys see that one? Yep. You guys saw that one? Okay, so the the interesting thing is that um, this is something that's taught. And the idea is you, you take an ultrasound probe, and you're actually going to put it on that um, enlarged area, which um, I was saying initially is going to start off um, being really fluid-filled, and then later, as Dixon and I discussed, is going to start to get really a, a thickening, a smooth muscle proliferation, et cetera. But, but early on, it's going to be this fluid-filled area, and there actually can be um, filarial worms inside this fluid filled area and you could see them moving around um and i I would say that um if you have a high quality um uh, ultrasound machine and you could see them then you know and everything else that that it makes sense but this article that they talk about came out a few years ago and it basically was people were concerned and they did ultrasound and they looked at a bunch of people, a dozen or more people who had no, no risk factors. They shouldn't have lymphatic filariasis, but yet they appeared to have what looked like a filarial dance song. It, looked, it almost looked like there was, um, I shouldn't say song, just filarial dance. There's no singing. <laughs> it's just worms wiggling around. Um, and then, you know, so, so, so it is one of these interesting things. That, you know, one is, why are you doing it, right? You know, you've got a person, they're in an endemic area, they've got this enlarged thing um you know is it a novelty um you know is it something that you know as we see here does it really have a, a specificity behind it or you know it, it's not that sensitive anyway but uh, i have to admit it is entertaining it's one of those things that if you could show this to an audience it's quite impressive oh yes and i'm sure some of them would get up and leave the room <laughs> Yeah, so this will be the show notes, so people can go on there and click, and they can see. But uh, yeah, we so we did have ultrasound in in this area, but the ultrasound was being used for the pregnant women, and um, I have to say, the quality of the ultrasound, I had a lot of trouble with. Um, it, you don't necessarily have the same quality machines that you have in the in, um, we'll say, New York City or the surrounding areas in. Um, in eastern Uganda. So the ultrasound they had, very fuzzy, uh, very difficult to see. I'm not sure it would have helped much in the diagnosis, but sort of point taken that this was actually brought into the discussion, the filarial dance sign, because it is one of those things that Mm. um, is in the books. 
All right. Can you take the next one, Daniel? Pete writes, dear hosts, I only have a couple minutes, so I am going to wing this without checking references. I say filariasis, commonly called elephantiasis. And if I'm correct, credit to TWIP, because while I have always had an odd fascination with parasites, my background is aerospace engineering and IT. And I believe what I know of filariasis is from Dixon's descriptions in early TWIP episodes. Thanks for the show. And Daniel has been a great addition. And I really like the new direction the show took after he joined. Aloha, Pete. Nice. Chris writes, dear Twipsters, we reached an unbelievable 80 Fahrenheit yesterday in Athens, Georgia. I'm not even sure I remember what winter is supposed to be. In this case, Wuchereria Bancrofty with Hydroseal. I'm interested to hear any anecdotes the TWIP trio might have on this parasite. It might be very odd in some circles to have a favorite parasite, but Wuchereria and the filarial worms in general have long been mine, both for the intriguing life cycle and the complex relationship they have with their host. That's interesting, yeah. I, I, I was at one time very much attracted to these parasites also from an immunological standpoint, wondering why in their presence – the inner lining of the um, lymphatic vessel, uh, actually, um, the cells do not divide. These parasites produce something, which is a, an anti-mitotic agent, which after the parasite dies, it just reverses everything. And they were put on hold as long as the parasites were alive. And as soon as they died, this thing just absolutely proliferated and blocked the whole thing up. So it's a strange pathology and a strange... Very, very unusual uh, life cycle, to, to say the least. Dixon, you're next. Okay, Delbert writes, hello, Twipsters. My guess for the case for Twip 165 is lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis. The scrotum development was a hint leading me to this diagnosis, and the information about people with large swollen legs clinched the diagnosis for me. And then he goes on to list a, a whole bunch of, of, of physical and uh, biological uh, characteristics of the areas for transmission. Uh, he talks about the uh, the period of several years of its tolerance. That's what I was just uh, discussing, basically, with regards to uh, the, the uh, inflammation that doesn't develop. And then as the worm dies, it becomes hyper-inflammatory. Uh, and this causes the, uh, the pathology associated with it. So in the last email we just read, it wasn't the microfilaria, actually, that caused the blockage. It was the dead adults. Um, and then, um, let's see where I picked this up. He mentions, uh, surgery and DEC as a combination therapy and pressure bandages may decrease the edema. And he also wants us to know that, um, other species of filarial causing, uh, worms, particularly Borgia malayi, um, don't live in the area that this uh, case is from. So therefore it's probably going to be Borgia, uh, which area Bancrofty. And he also indicates he'd love a signed copy of the book and hopes to win. Well, that is it. That's all 27 uh, emails. That's incredible. That is incredible. And I know it's a long read, but we love each and every one of these. Uh, We do. We actually do. They're great. So, Daniel, what do we do next? It seems like everyone had the same answer. (laughs) So, why? I'm curious why we got so many responses. Was it that people – uh, just were excited about this or was it a slam dunk or what did they, what did they think? So, uh, but I guess before I do the unveil, what do you, what do you two think? Are you going to go with the, uh, <laughs> well, I hope we do, because if we don't, then we really haven't studied parasitic diseases, sixth edition very well. Um, no, I, I concur entirely with 27 diagnosticians. This is a clear cut case basically of which area Bancrofty filariasis. And, and for me, it was cemented by your saying of a sister having the big, the big legs, right? The swollen legs that really, so yeah, I agree. So the only challenge it sounds like was just getting the pronunciation down for you, Vincent, but otherwise the diagnosis was in hand. Which your uh, area bankrupt? <laughs> okay. It, it, yeah. And, and I will, I will agree. I'm, we're all on the same page here. And the interesting issue is, do you even need to do any diagnostic tests beyond this? We're, we're in, we're, this boy is coming from an area um, that I, I described was north of the clinic, an area where, um, unfortunately, emphatic filariasis is still endemic. 
Um, and as you watch the improvements in Uganda, this is one of the areas that still um, has um, this problem. Uh, the challenge is, is what are we going to do about this boy? So people brought up uh, NGOs and the government uh, tracking and trying to make um, regions filarial free. Um, and uh, this boy is, is infected. Uh, but it's really the biggest challenge acutely for him is, is surgery. These are not easy surgeries. And in a lot of these rural areas, the, the failure rate from the surgery can be, let's say, 20%, 25%. Um, so in addition to treatment, it's actually uh, trying to get a surgeon who's more skilled. So in this case, um, with the focus talking about surgery, we actually uh, referred uh, this boy to to the hospital and not to the local hospital, but actually to a hospital a little farther afield. Uh, where the surgeons um, have a have a higher success rate, I'll say. So when you say failed surgery, what what do you mean, to Daniel? Um, so they'll go they'll go in and they'll do the surgery, and initially the boy will have the um, the, the loss of the swelling, um, but then over the next year it'll reaccumulate. Hmm. Um, and we have to do is you have to really you know it's surgically challenging. You have to remove this whole potential. Um, space so that it can't reaccumulate and then go through the changes that Dixon was describing where um, over time it can have um, this smooth muscle proliferation and all these inflammatory changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what did you do in this case, Daniel? Uh, So in this case, it was referral to a surgeon. Um, I think I pointed out that our clinic is in an area where there was not a lot of this left. So part of it was the recognition and sort of the teaching the uh, the other medical staff, what this was, because they're a little unfamiliar with it, and then getting the boy referred to the uh, the big city hospital uh, for surgical treatment. Oh, good luck to him. Yeah, yeah. And it's tough. A lot of these organizations have um, ways of helping finance um, this, but that's another part too, is that, uh, you know, in areas where uh, all the costs of things are not covered, um, it can be a challenge. Uh, mm. for for a boy to actually get this treatment and and I know someone mentioned that there was this she was told in high school that uh that people think this is a sign of virility i I've never run across people think this is a sign of virility actually um unfortunately, I think a lot of people have seen the the really large scrotum so big that actually people are are carrying their scrotum around using a wheelbarrow i mean it's really mm-hmm. the uh, the morbidity, the um, impact on um, the activities of daily living. Um, and they talk about dailies. Um, basically, uh, this could be a huge problem. And I think when the boy sees that here I am as a teenager and I'm already getting this enlargement, they they know where it's headed. And it's not headed towards something that's going to make them popular with the ladies. It's something that's going to um, really be a problem for them trying to just uh, be productive yeah. um, in life and such. So, well, shall we move on to a paper, Daniel? Certainly. Now, in the interest of time, maybe we could uh, s- sort of summarize this in an informative way. No, I think that's reasonable. So, do you want to you want to read us the title and authors? Yeah, and we'll try to do a executive level summary. All right. So, this is published in Frontiers in Immunology. The title is Activation of Human. CD11B positive B1 B cells by trypanosoma cruzi derived proteins is associated with protective immune response in human Chagas disease. So uh, here the first author is Livia Silva Araujo Passos, and the last author is Walderes Ornelas Dutra, and this comes from a variety of uh, institutions in Brazil. Uh, the Institute of Biological Sciences, the Univers- Federal University of Minas Gerais, um, the Institute of René Rachou in Oswaldo Cruz, uh, the uh, Federal University of Minas Gerais, and uh, the AC Camargo Cancer Center in Sao Paulo, and the Instituto Nacional, Instituto Nacional de Ciencia e Tecnologia Doenças Tropicae in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Wow, it's in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> All right, Daniel, what's the story here? All right. Be- so we're, your we're favorite gonna... cells, right? Well, well, they're they're my favorite. Yeah, you know why they're my favorite cells? They're my favorite cells because I was actually the one who described this uh, this cell. Mm-hmm. So they you know, always have a special. They will always have a special place in my heart. Um, <laughs> actually, yes, and because of that, uh, they may protect other people's hearts. Uh, we've talked a little bit in the past about um, the distinction of the immune system between B cells and T cells, and B cells between the B two cells that people normally think about that when we get a vaccination make protective immunoglobulins or antibodies, and then B1 cells that are a much more primitive uh, cell, which actually has the ability to um, phagocytic function, uh, produce a lot of cytokines, they can control other cells, etc. And then among the B1 cells, um, one of the distinctions that um, the group that I was working with made was between what we call the CD11B positive or B1 orchestrators and the CD11B negative B1 secretors. And CD11B is a a protein that can sit on the surface of certain B1 cells or not. Um, It's a normal protein that is associated with macrophages. It's associated with the ability to bind to things. And what they're pointing out here is if you look at the, the numbers uh, and the activation of the CD11B positive B1 orchestrators, you actually see that the individuals tend to have some sort of a protective immune response, protecting their hearts from human Chagas disease. And so let's, let's sort of look at the high points. So the high points, um, I'm going to point out, I guess, in the first figure, figure one is this gating strategy that, um, that we introduced where you look at B cells and then you look at ones that have 27, CD27 on the surface and CD43 on the surface. And that allows us to distinguish between um, B2 memory cells, naive B2 cells, and then the B1 cells. And then you take your B1 cells and just look at the ones that have 11B on the surface or not making these two subsets. And they actually went ahead and they looked at, I'm going to move people at there. I bet everyone's got the uh, figures in front of them. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> another, uh, uh, if all, you're all following at home. Um, but they, they do this um, analysis, which are jumping ahead of figure four, where they actually, they do a correlation between what are the percent of the B1 CD11B positive, it was called the B1 orchestrators, and the left ventricular um, ejection fraction. So a good ejection fraction is when the heart squeezes, you get a really good pump forward. And um, the more, um, in general, the more of these orchestrators you have, the better heart function uh, the patients had. And then they, oh, you were going to jump in? I'm just going to ask, so they take patients with the different presentations, right? Um, Yeah, yes. With Uh, with, uh, uninfected people, they have people with chronic um, Chagas and then with heart issues, right? And they purify these cells from them and then, uh, they look at the fractions, they look at how many, but then they also uh, treat them with uh, fractions from T. cruzi, right? Yeah, so there were, I, I think this is probably important for, you know, we talked a little about the immunology. So the other side is what about Chagas? When a, when a person isn't infected with Chagas, that's fine, all good. But then a person gets infected with Chagas and for a long period of time, they can remain in this indeterminate um, stage where we don't know, are they going to develop mm-hmm. heart problems or they develop in Central America um, intestinal problems, uh, but folks just on heart problems. And then there's people who go on and develop heart problems. And it's a pretty high percent, let's say a quarter, a third of people will go on and develop a heart issue, but we don't know who. And um, so the indeterminate is when we're waiting to see what happens. And then there's people that have um, Chagas with cardiac manifestations, so cardiac Chagas patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're looking at that. And what, what I think they're trying to, to hopefully find here, and this is an important issue, is people who have uh, a higher percent of the uh, B1 orchestrators and, and more activation uh, look like they're protected from going on to develop um, cardiac Chagas disease. And they also find that, uh, so they make three fractions from T. cruzi cultures, protein, glycolipid, and lipid-enriched 
fractions and they they add these to the to the b cells right exactly yeah and see and see what happens and these these patients have the same number of b cells but the effect of of these fractions is different in particular pro the protein fraction activates the b1 b cells and that activation is associated with a beneficial clinical status right Exactly. And they talk a little bit about this, you know, what's contained in this, uh, this protein enriched fraction. And they have some ideas, but that, that's something that requires more work, right, to figure out exactly what's doing this. Yeah, I think there's still there still is more work. So we're, we're starting to get, I think, the foundation starting to get some interesting ideas here. Um, but yeah, we're not, there's still a lot to do. I was just going to um, interject that I was struck by the fact that that you could divide off patients into those three categories. So do you think that there are subsets of people living together which differ genetically and therefore the parasite expresses itself differently in these patients? Or perhaps there are different strains of the parasites in the same genetic background that give you these outcomes? So I, I think there's two aspects to that. One is um, there there does look like, so in our work and the work of some other people, there are clearly differences in um, how many um, or what percent of your B1 cells are B1 orchestrators. Um, and part of that correlates with age. We, we tend to uh, lose our B1 cells as we get older. So that may be part of why we see um, cardiac chagas develop as a person ages. They may be losing this protective population. Um, so there's an age issue. It looks like there's also a genetic issue in the um, number of these cells you have. And it may also be a lifestyle. We, we were looking at this. Uh, I remember like the one person that we saw with the highest number of the B1 orchestrators was a, um, a marathon runner. Um, so there may even be things that you can do that affect this population. Interesting. Daniel, what is the um, significance of the, the experiment with these gamma delta T cells from the indeterminate patients? Let me go to this one. So this is the figure five where they're looking at. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the gamma delta T cells, there, there's the idea is with um, among T cells, there's also a more primitive type of T cell. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're also looking to see if there's... Um, uh, a different frequency of expression of certain cytokines. So look at TNF alpha and IL-10 in, in these more primitive um, T cells when you go ahead and actually stimulate them with the pro fraction. Mm -hmm. um, and you could see some differences there. What is the practical uh, significance of this finding, Daniel? So I, I think um, I wish there was more practical. I mean, one of the one of the issues that we're we're trying to sort out, and, and this was sort of discouraging a few years back, is is we looked at taking people that we felt were at high risk for going on to develop cardiac Chagas disease. We treated them all, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't clear that we were making a difference. Um, so I, ideally, in a perfect world, we would say, oh, now we know who needs treatment, who doesn't. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. at least we may start to get at who is going to go on. You know, most people who are infected with Chagas disease will be completely fine. And, you know, a big subset, a third, let's say, will develop disease. It would be nice to figure out who will go on to develop disease. And maybe if we can, you know, keep the levels of these cells um, elevated, maybe a level of protection can prevent that third from going on to develop disease. So we're not we're not there. But they they say at the end, uh, their findings may be useful to develop immunotherapy for Chagas cardiomyopathy. Yeah, they actually talk about trying to expand the. They, they're saying not just that it's the the B1 orchestrators, but maybe there's, maybe there are particular clones of the B1 orchestrators. And if you can expand those clones through sort of immunotherapeutic strategies, you could either prevent Chagas disease or in someone who already has Chagas disease, have a immunomodulatory um, therapy. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I, it's, that's good stuff. So, uh, Daniel, there's a paper they reference here. It's Griffin and Rothstein called a small CD11B positive human B1 cell subpopulation stimulates T cells and is expanded in lupus. Journal of Experimental Medicine, 2011. Is that the discovery paper? 
That is. That's the paper where we describe for the first time this um, subpopulation of B1 cells. Nice. We should have done that first. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. Well, we'll put a link to it in the show notes so pe- so people can see the original paper. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. And, wh- and where were you when you did that, Daniel? Uh, that was actually at the Feinstein Institute. So that was on Long Island at uh, where Yosef Davidoff it is. So oh, okay. At the North Well, at the Point North Shore LIJ system. All right. Cool. All right, uh, Dixon. Yes. You, uh, do we have a hero in sight? We do. We do. We do. We do. <clears throat> in this um, episode of Heroes in Parasitic Diseases and Parasitology, we have um, Francesca Mutapi. Mutapi. Francesca Mutapi. She's PhD uh, holder of a degree. She grew up in Zimbabwe and then went on to study at the University of Oxford as a bite trust scholar. After completing postdoctoral training at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, she went on to become a leader in the emerging field of global health with a focus on tropical diseases. Mutapi is credited with prioritizing schistosomiasis as a public health concern for the WHO and has championed a multidisciplinary approach to global health that incorporates economic, cultural, technological, and evidence-based challenges to global health problems. Mutapi is also credited with advancing our understanding of the immune responses to helmets. So she has a broad base in her uh, interests and has expressed them very well over the course of her career so far. She's still very active, still very um, uh, energetic, and we hope we hear more from her in the future that we can recite her in our book. In addition to her scientific work, she's a painter. How about that? Using funds from her work to support education in Zimbabwe. Wow. Nice. Wow, it is nice. <clears throat> Vincent, are we going to give away a book? Oh, we didn't do that, did we? We had 23 people who had not won a book before. So let's find a random number between 1 and 23. Here we go. Oh, my goodness. It's 21. My heavens. Which is Pete, our IT guy. Nice. He, uh, all right, Pete. So uh, congratulations. You probably are in Hawaii because you said aloha. But anyway, send your uh, address to um, twip at microbe.tv. We'll send you a book sometime in the next year. Right. By the way, speaking of Hawaii, they just had a snowstorm on Maui. That is amazing. Amazing weather changes that we're experiencing. Crazy stuff, right? All right, but uh, it's all normal, Dixon. You know that. Right? Uh, of course. <laughs> Daniel, you got a new case for us? I, I do, actually. Let me uh, reach my notes over here. I'm going to take us uh, quickly back from Uganda. Don't, don't everyone worry. We will be back there again. But this was a recent um, consult that I got from a friend of mine who is a uh, gastroenterologist. And he called me with the concern that he had a 61-year-old woman who uh, was on a, a girl's trip. And she took a girl's trip to Thailand and Cambodia for a few weeks. Um, and she, she went to a, a number of different places. And uh, you know, she tried different things. And things were going well. And then she developed, what do you guys think she developed? Diarrhea. Diarrhea. Uh, <laughs> And so she went ahead and she took um, azithromycin. So Zithromac, or z- she had that stuff, the stuff that people might know of in a Z pack. She took three days, 500 milligrams a day, and the diarrhea did not go away. It actually continued. Uh, back in the States, it's now at this point been going on for a few weeks. Uh, she feels left lower abdominal pain, um, discomfort. She feels bloated. She feels gassy. Uh, she's continuing to have, uh, loose stools. Uh, and it's, it's sort of sticky, uh, sort of foul, foul smelling sticky stools. And, uh, I want people to think, um, I, I will, I'm going to help you say this, this is going to be a parasite. Uh, what, what do we do to diagnose it? And then once we do diagnose it, um, how are we going to treat it? I think this is a, another one that hopefully people will feel like it's uh, within the realm. 
Now, on this trip, Daniel. Yes. Was, was she sexually active? Uh, she, you, you know, Vincent, you always ask the right questions. Um, she was not sexually active, but I do think that that is relevant. Did she eat everything and drink everything? Uh, yes, exactly. Um, she, yeah, she was not very restrictive in what she ate. I, I, I was waiting for you guys to ask if she enjoyed any of the somtom, which, you know, was in every, every case, <laughs> uh, but she did not report having tried the somtom. So she's going to have to go back. Uh, and what about water? What was the source of her drinking water? <clears throat> so it was actually a very nice, um, uh, we'll say nice hotels. So she was drinking bottled water. Did she eat raw dishes? You didn't eat some tom, but anything else raw? So she did not describe eating raw, any raw items. Okay. In fact, I, I think I know what this is because Marlene and I, my wife and I, have traveled to this very area uh, several times. And um, one of those trips resulted in this particular um, parasitic infection in, in my wife. So I, I've got first, second, I would call that secondhand experience, but I think that... Uh, Knowing what this is um, doesn't mean that because you're careful, you'll avoid it. That's what I was going to say. Well, if you don't eat, if you don't eat or drink, can you? We were, avoid we were both very careful about what we ate and what we drank, and we still ran into it. So yeah. it, it's, there's no guarantee that um, when we when we come to discuss this, I'm sure we'll go through the details. But uh, but it wasn't the first time that my wife had it either. She's done some right. extensive traveling too. Ah, so reinfections may occur. Indeed. That's, an, Indeed. that's interesting. Yeah, very, right. very interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but not for the person who it occurred in. <laughs> yes, of course. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Look forward to the next episode of TWIP, which you can find at microbe.tv slash TWIP in any podcast player that you listen to podcasts. You can listen to TWIP, and we would like you to subscribe so we know how many people are listening. And uh, if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. You could give as little as a buck a month to hear all this great science. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute to find out how you can do that. Of course, your questions, comments, case guesses, TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, a pleasure as always. Dixon de Pommier is at Trichinella.org and TheLivingRiver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. Strange not seeing you. Sorry. Well, <laughs> you will. You will. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to Ronald Jenkins for the music and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic.